This is Chemical Manipulation, a fantastic book written by the one and only Michael Faraday. The book details the lab techniques used by chemists like Faraday at the Royal Institute of London during the early 1800s. In section IV, under entry 157, Faraday describes something he calls a crucible furnace, which he claims to use for everything from simple distillations and heating flasks to melting iron as a desktop blast furnace. I want to reproduce one of these furnaces and try to learn to use it. If it is even a fraction as versatile as Faraday suggests, I think I'll have quite a few uses for it, as well as it being potentially interesting insight into chemistry during the heart of the scientific revolution. Faraday says an aspiring chemist could purchase all the parts of his furnace from vendors, needing only minor modifications to be used as a furnace. But 200 years later, those vendors no longer exist, so I'm going to have to make it entirely from scratch. And because this is a scrap craft project, I'm only going to use natural and scrap materials to do so. In the book, Faraday writes that his crucible furnace is based on a clay pot made from plumbum-infused clay. To those who know Latin, you may think this plumbum refers to lead, but actually it's a reference to graphite. This means the clay will have a high elemental carbon content. I don't have loads of graphite on hand, so I'm going to use charcoal dust with the alchemist's clay recipe I showed in another video. Obviously, charcoal and graphite have very different properties, and I would not be surprised in the slightest if Faraday's furnace could withstand many more thermal cycles than mine will. But being that my clay recipe comes from the great Islamic Golden Age alchemist Al-Razi, and was used for his furnaces over a thousand years ago, I'm certain it will at least work to some degree, and will make this project a little bit of a mashup of historical chemistry technology. After building up the pot, I drilled some holes and carved grooves to Faraday's exact specifications. Then I finally fired it. Faraday does not tell me if his pots were fired in oxidation or reduction, so I chose the simplest option to fire in an open oxidizing pit, similar to my ancient forge project, making this furnace terracotta. So yet again, I'm dancing around the historical technology timeline now back tens of thousands of years. While I fired the pot, I also fired some other things, including a small grill, which will sit just beneath the second row of holes in the furnace to hold the fuel off the ground. So as you can see the fire is out and I'm pulling the things I've fired out of the fire. Um, but what's interesting is the pot still has red coals in it. It's still actively glowing red in there. I think that's the aspiration of the furnace design already at work. While the pot is the main component of the furnace, Faraday insists on using a removable metal chimney, only about two feet long, and claims the combination of the furnace and smokestack will get iron white hot with very little effort from the user. This is old corrugated sheet metal. It's used for roofing, specifically things like chicken coops, dog houses, cattle feeders, that sort of thing. Whatever this thing was used to roof, has long since rotted away, and I found this piece in the woods on top of a pile of rotten wood sort of deep in the dirt. So, um, I think it will work to make my chimney out of. It's riddled with holes, uh, so it might take a little finessing, but I think it will work. First, I need to identify what type of metal my scrap is. To check for zinc or zinc galvanization, I submerged a piece of the metal in vinegar. Nothing happened. For comparison, I dropped a galvanized steel pipe, and as you can see, it bubbles profusely as it generates hydrogen gas. As I was doing this, it occurred to me it was obvious what the metal was, and I'm sure at least a few of you have guessed by now. So to confirm, I prepared another solution, this time of dilute sodium hydroxide, and dropped in the scrap. It immediately began to bubble, confirming that it is in fact aluminum metal. Aluminum may not be perfect for this application due to its very low melting point but I continued to work it anyways. It is very reflective in IR, which means it should resist being heated radiatively, and its high thermal conductivity should spread the heat that does reach it around evenly. Its melting point would be a problem if it weren't for my intention to only use the chimney intermittently, as running the furnace continuously with the chimney would be wildly inefficient. A lot of people may think a chimney's role is just to give a place for the exhaust gases to go, but in reality, they have a large impact on how a fire burns. The chimney creates a column of hot air. As the hot air moves up the column, it creates a displacement, a little like raising the plunger in a doctor's syringe. This displacement sucks more air into the furnace, which invigorates the flame. The taller the chimney, the larger the displacement. 
This increased airflow increases the burn rate and raises the temperature of the fire higher than it would naturally be. In the case of charcoal, it can be a lot higher. This is an old fence and this is electrical wire. It used to be an electric fence, which for the most part would be run through the fence itself. But here at the gate, it goes underground just for a few feet. And for those few feet, it's copper wire. So I'm going to use this copper to make my rivets for my chimney. The way a chimney increases the fire's temperature comes with a trade-off, as the same displacement that invigorates the flame and makes the furnace more effective has the consequence of carrying up to 70% of the heat energy generated into the air above the chimney, where it's effectively wasted. This is actually why, prior to the Industrial Revolution, houses commonly didn't have chimneys, as it was far more fuel efficient to cook your food on a chimneyless fire and just let the smoke percolate through your straw-thatched roof. The introduction of chimneys into cities that enabled denser living spaces ended up requiring people to use three times as much fuel to cook for the same amount of time as it did before the widespread use of the chimney. The same problem existed in chemical furnaces as it did in kitchens. This furnace provides a nifty way around the problem by making the chimney removable. A low temperature efficient burn is as easily acquired as a high temperature inefficient burn. However, this means running the furnace is always going to be a balancing act of trading off energy quantity for temperature and vice versa. Achieving the requisite temperature and energy quantity for a chemical reaction as quickly and efficiently as possible will take a lot of practice. I will likely use the chimney to start the furnace, but shift over to using a bellows or something similar for the majority of the firing. Faraday suggests doing exactly this, mentioning the fuel efficiency as his reasoning. This makes the fact that the chimney is removable very convenient. The sheet metal design of this chimney is quintessential to Faraday's time. Only a few years earlier in the historical timeline, and sheet metal products would have been very, very expensive. But with the rise of industrial manufacturing, things like lightweight chimney pipes became widespread. I think the fact that half the furnace is pottery, an old art so attached to the traditional ways of life, whereas the other half is sheet metal, an icon of the industrial world, will make this furnace seem strange on an aesthetic level. It's the meeting point between two disparate worlds, and it's especially strange to see the pieces of it out of place and in our own world with a sheet metal that once would have been prohibitively expensive to even look at is now littering first as abandoned remains of the incredible growth that came before. My favorite part of historical design is almost always the beautiful and elegant simplicity of the solutions they provide. However, this simplicity is almost always matched by a demand for skill on the part of the user. I have no idea if my first attempts at reactions in this furnace will be successful at all. I've never used a furnace like this, and I'm still very much a novice to the art of manipulating fire in general. In Faraday's time, chemists would have been very adept at the use of fire, and were even called the philosophers by fire. In old chemical and even alchemical texts, the word fire is almost used as a placeholder for the word truth. If something is proven true, it is said to have been confirmed in fire. If a hypothesis is proven wrong, it has been rejected by the fire. Centuries before Faraday's time, these words would be scrawled in Latin along the margins of notebooks, alongside the hypothetical formulas they pertain to. These days, it's rare to even just see the use of a Bunsen burner in a lab, largely due to the many contributions Faraday himself made in the field of electricity. There you go. So it's really, it's not beautiful. That is not my, that is not my best riveting work. Well, okay, technically it is because I haven't riveted anything before this, but um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can do better, but it, it was an interesting learning experience.
got the holes patched, and as the chimney pipe is finished, I just need to attach the funnel to the bottom end. Might be kind of tricky. I don't know. <laughs> now that we've completed the chimney, it's time to make the fuel. Faraday specifies to use charcoal with the furnace. Just as with my ancient furge, I'm making this by heating cellulose, this time from fallen cherry branches in a strongly reducing atmosphere. I decided to attempt distilling the pyrolysis vapors of this batch, as Faraday mentions pyroligonous spirit later in chemical manipulation, and I was curious to see if I could source some of my own. I was careful not to seal the lid of the charcoal vessel, as if the condenser pipe clogged, it could easily lead to an explosion of very flammable gases. But luckily for me, for a few wonderful minutes, I was able to capture a bottle of cool vapor before a clog occurred. I found that after the vapor condensed, the fluid was largely water, but also very acidic and smelled strongly of barbecue potato chips. I'll probably have a video about this pyroligonous fluid sometime in the future. With the batch complete, I can finally start up the furnace. However, without anything to heat in the furnace, it would be a waste of time and energy. To test the furnace, I made myself a quick sponge cake and had brunch with the family. Sponge cakes use an obscene amount of eggs, and eggshells are primarily calcium carbonate. So I saved off the eggshells in order to calcify them or thermally decompose the calcium carbonate into the much more dangerous and exciting calcium oxide. Faraday specifies to light the furnace with a little brown paper, so I threw in a crumpled sheet and a few broken wood splints along with smaller chunks of charcoal. The strong draft from the chimney makes the act of lighting the furnace easy and fast and for a brief period summons a column of flame through the length of the chimney. Once the paper and wood burns away and the coals are lit, the furnace rapidly increases in temperature to a blistering white heat until the chimney is removed. After my first run, I had made only a tiny fraction of progress in converting the calcium. It was clear my method could use some work. But by the third attempt, after switching to a steel crucible instead of ceramic, and working out a sort of ballet of moving between the chimney, to the fuel, to stirring the contents of the crucible, to the bellows, and then back again, I was able to achieve closer results to what I was hoping. Not a full conversion, not even close, but I managed to make a small amount of pure white oxide mixed in with burnt, unconverted eggshell. To prove this is in fact calcium oxide I've made, I'm going to use it to try to create the ever-useful sodium hydroxide lye in a double displacement reaction. By mixing the powder I created with water, the oxide tears apart water molecules to form calcium hydroxide. I then filter this calcium hydroxide solution through a thin piece of cotton as a Kerr's filter to remove most of the eggshell left behind. Then I dissolved a small amount of sodium carbonate into water and stirred it for a minute or so till the solution was clear. Adding a few drops of this solution to the test tube containing the calcium hydroxide solution creates a puff of white in the vial. The white is calcium carbonate precipitating, leaving sodium hydroxide behind in solution. I felt the sediment in the tube made this reaction a little unclear, so I filled another tube with better filtered calcium hydroxide made from the rest of my yield. Here you can really see the cloud forming as soon as the two liquids touch. Double displacements are always my favorite type of reaction, because of how showy they are. Though I still have a lot to learn with this furnace, I'm going to end this video here. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video or have suggestions for how I can make these videos more bearable, please subscribe and tell me in the comments. It would mean the world to me. Thanks!